It is two o'clock, so welcome to Canvas Hour. Thank you very much for joining us. I think this is the, the last iteration of a really wonderful session on planning, uh, planning a lesson. Um, and so this whole program kind of focuses on kind of the intersection of skills in Canvas and skills with um, one approach to course design called backward design which is very useful in kind of helping us kind of align everything we're doing in a in a logical order. So our presenters today are Deepti Karad from the Dreben School. She, she teaches pre-service teachers. And Suleiman Tech from uh, mathematics. He's, uh, he's going to tell us about our uh, his calculus course. Uh, and so um, they have a lot to say and uh, I want to turn it over to them. Deepti and Suleiman, thank you so much. All right, great. So Suleiman's going to share the screen, and I've also shared the um, link to this presentation in the chat. And Suleiman, you want to start? Yep. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Thank you for coming out this last session of this uh, our webinar, and. Uh, we would like to talk about our uh, experience with DIPTI planning, how we plan our lessons, and then I hope you will have also a discussion and everybody else would be also sharing their experience as well. And uh, as, a, as a background picture, uh, DIPTI choose this, this nice map type of thing, so when we get onto the road, we better tell to our GPS where we would like to go, otherwise we may not end up where place that we are expecting to go so in that sense and that might be the tool also for our courses as well so if you think if we plan what we would like to get at the end of our course then that will be a good experience for us and as well as for our students and i was listening an audiobook uh, the other day and it gave a very good analogy it was about leadership but i think we can adapt this to the, our courses as well if you don't have our goals, if you don't have our vision for our course, uh, think about two, two, two person, one of them is driving in a nice clear road, and then that person go with the speed limit and everything, so, and then find a destination. But if you don't have our goals and the vision for our course, that person is kind of driving his or her car with a, a very, uh, like maybe the, the cloudy or very dark road, then that person uh, would not be able to go as fast as the other person because he doesn't know what's going to uh, have in the next maybe meter or three feet away. So in that sense, having an uh, end in mind is very important uh, in our courses. So now we are going to have a, a little poll everywhere activity. So you can type uh, this, maybe we can put it in the chat as well. So you can yeah, click put it in the chat. The, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dipti. You can just click on that uh, poll in the chat. So let me also share. Stop sharing and then reshare it again. So if you click on the link in the chat, it should take you to the poll. And there are just a couple of questions there, very short. And in case you're wondering, it's using the software called Poll Everywhere, which uh, we have through UIW as well. So it's just like two question poll, just to get some opinion feedback from you all. And the first question is, what one word, one word would you use to describe yourself after the spring semester or when we are getting ready to the fall semester? Okay, some of you relax, some others exhausted. You have Canvas, you're in the transition of LMS, so that's right. Tired, dread, confidence, excited. Yep, very nice. Renewal, yep. 
thank you all very much for your sharing your word that describes your mellow. Okay, that sounds interesting. And the the cases keep coming. Thank you. And I think the the big one is exhausted, and the other the big other big word is the relax. So it's kind of balancing each other. <laughs> So the second one is, what do you want to get out of this webinar? So let's start some information about Canvas. Yeah, we'll talk about some tips and tricks here and there, not, but not primarily about the Canvas, this presentation. Information about converting to Canvas. And we will share our experience, actually, how we build our modules but not the, the technical details of it. Major points, yes, course development, yes, we will talk about that. Course content, yep. How to successfully implement Canvas. I think the, the ideas that we'll discuss uh, will help uh, you and each of us to how to prepare better our uh, courses on, on Canvas. Even that can be face-to-face -face or online as well. Thank you all very much for sharing your thoughts about, about our presentation. Now we will go back to our And this, this slide link has been shared from the chat, so you have access and you are going to have access to these slides as well. So now uh, I turn over to the deep team. Thank you, Suleiman. So several of you wrote that um, you wanted to know more about Canvas. And I think that what this, and as Susan said also, what this offers this today's webinar is not so much the nuts and bolts of Canvas things, but it's like how to use Canvas well. And um, so from a teaching point of view, and I think that's, I know, something that I really needed once I was best, past the really basic, like how to set up my first, you know, homepage or something like that in Canvas, I started needing information to help me make good choices about which tools to implement and how to use them. And I think this will help us. We definitely, you will see a lot of use of modules in this class. In, I mean, today's session, and um, I think that's something that's very helpful. At first, I was a little intimidated by using that because I thought that was a little too advanced. I just wanted to get the basics down. Um, but I find that for the students and for me, it keeps everything better organized and more easily accessible. There's more clarity. And um, it's also easier when people are absent because you can, you can just go to the module. So it makes life a little easier that way. So our learning objectives specifically for today are we wrote them as these uh, I can statements. And one of the nice things of thinking about objectives this way is it puts the shift away from ourselves as teachers, but onto our students, or in this case, you, the participants. What do we want our students to be able to do, right? So we hope that at the end of today, all of us can describe some of the benefits of backward instructional design. Um, three of the steps, the three steps that we're using to implement backward instructional design in our course design. And finally, that we can feel comfortable on how to design our own courses um, using Canvas and using backward design. So we have this little goal picture here, and um, it's to help us think about the fact that that's what we're, we're really thinking about and it's in terms of the goal, right? So backward design is an approach. It's not a, um, it's not a specific tool set or something, but it's a, an approach to planning instruction. And uh, this, there's a link here where it says, what is backward design? That's a link to a, an article by uh, Grant Wiggins and Jay McTighe, who started writing about this way of designing courses or designing teaching back in the 1990s. Okay, So one of the ways we can frame this is thinking about these four questions and in this order, okay? Starting out thinking about what's the goal, like Suleiman said, right? Um, thinking about whether it's our course, our unit, our lesson, or 
in other things, but in our in case we're talking about unit design and course design here. So that would be our objective. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like and how that's a little different in backward design. Then we want to think about, okay, so we know that that's the goal. What's the evidence that our students have met the goal? Okay, so the focus is on the students and we want to be thinking about how do we know we got there? And that's the assessment part. And then we want to think about what do they need to do with the material we're presenting or the information to meet that goal? And that's the performance. So what are the students doing? Okay, not what I'm doing. And then lastly, after all that, we come to the question of what do I as the instructor need to do to facilitate my students' learning? So sort of the last two together are what we think of as teaching, but a lot of times at the college level, we often focus on the last one, like what do I need to be doing? And backward design encourage us, encourages us to think first about what do my students need to be doing with the material we're presenting, because they're the ones who are learning this, not us, okay? So on this next slide, we kind of see backward design laid down in a slightly different way, but comparing it with the traditional way of designing instruction, which is that top teal kind of blue color. In a traditional design, we tend to start thinking about what our course is in terms of this general topic, right? We start with the title of the course and um, kind of what are the big chapters in our textbooks and things like that. So we move from those general topics and go over to plan, start planning lessons and activities right away. And we typically will think about, get our textbook out. We've spent a lot of time choosing it probably and look at the chapter headings. And then that becomes, you know, chapter one is week one and so on. And that becomes our kind of course planning right there. And then we'll bring in maybe guests or activities or extra readings related to the concepts of those chapters. And then finally, as we keep going, we think about, okay, well, I've covered chapters one through three. So what do my students need to know from those chapters? And we think about assessment based on the activities we've already done in class. So backward design asks us to flip that around and say, first of all, let's get really clear about the goal. So it's not it's not a general topic, it's very specific objectives. And um, once we zoom in to those smaller things, those more focused things, then we think about, okay, how will I know that we achieved that or well, that my students achieved that or that they've understood this or can apply it, right? So we start thinking of assessment right away and think about what do I need to see to know that my students have understood this material, can apply this material, can put it into practice. And then we want to know also what's happening along the way. It's kind of like monitoring progress, right? So if you go back to that roadmap, if we're on a trip, hopefully the only time we look at our map is not at the very beginning and the very end. It's along the way. We look at exit signs and we look at how much further we have to go. Do we need to take any detours? So there's that formative part. We call that formative assessment. So it helps us do some course corrections if we need to along the way. And once the assessment is in place, then we go back in backward design and say, okay, now let's look at how will we get there. Now we're planning the trip. So this is what we often think of as teaching. We're planning our instruction. And again, the focus is on how will the students engage with the knowledge and ideas. So this next slide, um, the left model is just kind of reiterating those ideas in a different way. So I will not read them again, um, just so you can see it in a simpler way. And then on the right, though, this part is about establishing curricular priorities, these ovals. And this is really worth considering. You know, we all tend to feel overwhelmed. I've never heard a faculty member say, oh, yeah, I have plenty of time in my class and to cover everything I need to, we always have far more than we feel we have time to cover in our classes. So we need to really break it down and think about what do my students kind of need to be familiar with so they should know about. And then in that smaller circle in the middle, what's important for them to know and do, but at the very core of it, what do I want them to walk out of here with and remember two years later? 
that's the stuff. That's the enduring understanding. And that's where we want to start. That's how we decide our specific goals instead of trying to make everything an equally important goal in our class in terms of learning targets. Okay. So here are some resources. Uh, each of these links is an active link, so you can go read more if you'd like to. So the first one is from the original authors, and it's just a chapter or introducing uh, this idea, their understanding by design is what they called it. Uh, the second one, The Cult of Pedagogy, is an excellent website that explores all sorts of topics about learning and teaching. And this is their page about backward design. And then the third one is from Vanderbilt University. It's their Center for Teaching and Learning for faculty. And um, this is their article about backward design. But again, they have a lot of extra other resources that are excellent. And finally, uh, the UIW flipped learning. So we brought that in because Suleiman and I, I both felt that our, our course design and planning benefited greatly from attending the flipped and academy, the flipped learning academy last summer. And especially in terms of thinking about how students engage with the work and about assessment. So these are the resources that are on our own UIW site and the Center for Teaching and Learning. So we are pointing you back to the team. And lastly, you'll hear a little bit about Bloom's taxonomy will come up a couple of times in this presentation. And the first article talks about what it is and why it's useful. And the second one is actually the link to this graphic that's on this page. So these, this is a way of thinking about the verbs we need to use as we're um, planning the, those learning objectives and thinking about what do our students need to be doing to engage with the material that they're learning about. And now in the next part, this so the next section, I forgot to say, so this we organized this seminar session today by first giving a little background, and then the rest of the talk will be having um, Suleiman is going to explain how we applied this in his class, which was an asynchronous online math class. And mine was a synchronous online class as well, but we felt that both these things still stand even in the land of face-to-face -face learning. Thank you, Dipti, for this nice introduction to, to backward design. So I generally teach like from college algebra uh, all the way to math modeling classes at the departments, whatever needed to be taught. So. But uh, last spring, I taught this calculus class and uh, as asynchronous course. And uh, so I would like to share uh, this experience. And after the presentation, if you have any like further questions, you can reach us out to, to discuss further uh, or sh would like to share any, any resources. We will be happy to do that. And let's first talk about the, the, the big picture. So. I'm going to discuss or talk about uh, writing the, the module learning objectives. So it could be also possible to talk about first the course objectives and then dividing to the, the modules, but because of the time. So I'm, I'm going to primarily focus on how I prepare one particular module. And when we talk about the, the learning objectives for a module or student learning outcomes for that module, so it's about what do we want to students experience and get uh, out of or at the end of that module, basically. And when uh, writing those objectives, uh, try to use more action words, measurable action words from the Bloom's taxonomy. And uh, you can, I also found some uh, specific math related uh, Bloom's taxonomy action works as well, so from other people. So you might find some resources related with your field as well. And after the objectives, uh, preparing the, the assessment tools. And for my case, it will be like a, a section homework on an online, online learning homework management system, section exit ticket, and, and discussion for most of the modules. And then after the preparing and planning the assessments, the preparing the learning resources, that might be the notes, reading from the textbooks, and also the videos for that, for that particular module. So now we are going to talk about the details of each of these, these items. So the, the first 
of them is the, the learning objective. As I said, so what do we want students remember from this module or to be able to perform after they finish, finish that module? Depending of, on your objectives, what are your expectations? And, and based on that, we are going to write down a list, a couple of objectives we really want students to focus on when they are uh, expose themselves to the, the to these resources that we are and activities that we are providing in this in this particular module, and uh, I find this writing the objectives when we when we start something not only for the courses and in my personal and professionally is also important when we start with something and writing our objectives, it really help us to break down and help us to organize our thoughts and the plans what we would like to achieve that that can be family related first professionally related or anything that you will we would like to achieve basically it is i find that is very important as well not only for our courses and the so the first one is writing the objectives and the second uh, list will be the preparing the and planning the assessments so one assessment item is the section homework on on web assign it's a uh, publishers uh, online homework management system and I was able to integrate that with the canvas so students can do everything within the canvas basically and in this assessment tool I use different type of questions to measure different type of objectives and also help students to get different type of skills so some of them might be just guided questions and some of them would be calculation or concept questions, graphical questions, as well as some applications. So how they apply the concepts they are uh, learning in a real life scenario, basically. And most of the questions in this assessment tool, they type their answers and they don't need to show their work to me. I can require them to show their work, but I use exit ticket for that purpose. And most of the questions are multiple choice questions, but there are, and there are also a lot of uh, enter, they need to enter. So there are no choices, they need to enter their number, their function. And I give them five trials to get uh, correct for each question. Each student get the problems with different numbers. And uh, so I give them uh, five trials I use this as a tool for them to practice and get more uh, confident about the resources. And if they submit 24 hours before the due date, I also give them 10% extra credit points. I want them to start this assessment ahead of time rather than waiting the last day or the last night. So if they submit 24 hours before the due date, they get extra points. And they cannot submit after the due date. So. Uh, for this particular uh, homework assignment. So the second assessment tool that I use for, uh, for a particular module is the section exit ticket. And this uh, exit, I prepare myself. So it's a kind of uh, home cookery uh, assessment tool. And the previous one was from the, the publishers. And I also try to choose different type of questions for this one as well. And the, I try to assess some math concepts they are learning. And as well as I would like to get some feedback from the students, how they are doing in that, uh, in that module, what are the modest points. And I want to also express what they learned by their own words, rather than just calculate this, solve this type of questions. I want them to also reflect on what they learn and what are the major important things in that in that particular module. And the other thing that I would like to assess is uh, not only see the re their results, but I want to see how they uh, end up with that result. So I want to, them to show their solution act, uh, actually. And I at least I put one or two questions they, where they need to upload their solution. And then, then I provide feedback to, to their solution as well. So in mathematics, not only the result, but how you get there is also important. Uh, so I would like to add these type of questions as well. And the third uh, assessment tool that I use is the discussion. And for the discussion also, uh, I use for different purposes uh, that might be uh, introduction to 
themselves to the class and to their peers. And some other discussion assignments might be primarily the concept that we are discussing in the class and ask them to write a reflection about it. And, or uh, I also want them to give some different type of learning and different soft skills like uh, growth mindset and the fixed mindset that I explored like past two, three years. And I put some short videos about it and then I want them to reflect on and what they think about those mindset and and also put some motivational five, five, six minutes motivational video, and then ask them to reflect on how they would do this uh, in the class particularly or uh, in their future career as well. Provide some resources about different math study skills and then also reflect them which one makes sense to them or what how they are uh, studying for the mathematics. And uh, so I try to use the the writing in in math class as well i think it is very important not only in the english class in math and everything else it is very important being able to express themselves in different settings is very important i also put some uh, math and art related discussion assignments where they need to generate some arts by using uh, functions these are just some examples uh, for from my discussion assignments up until like uh, spring of 2020 uh, I was thinking like how can I put a discussion assignment in math class uh, and then I at the beginning I didn't have that much idea and I explored more and then the ideas keep coming uh, so now I have many ideas but I have limited uh, uh, sections or the parts that I can include so I, I couldn't in, uh, maybe put that many so it is very important to have that and one particular uh, discussion assignment is called cardinal cafe for calculus one it is not for grade or anything i want them to put their question if they have any course related or any anything that they want to put and share with each other so that's a kind of safe environment they can chat with the, each other or if there's a common thread i also check time to time to see and address uh, common questions if there are any. So we talk about first we discuss the how we write the modules and then in these three things was the, about the, how we prepare the uh, assessment tools and the next thing is how we prepare the learning resources. And to, to prepare the learning resources uh, I use the the one word uh, the uh, sorry the word document and in that word document, I first write down the objectives and then uh, prepare the learning resources and then write down the, the assessments in that particular module that I am going to, to use. And in the next slide, I'm going to show you the screenshot of my word document. So uh, you don't need to look at and read every details that I just want you to see how it looks like. And then after I prepare all these resources, and I copy and paste to the, the canvas pages on, on, uh, under each module uh, as an objective learning resource and also uh, as assessment tools. And it is very, uh, for me, it worked very well. So it's very convenient when I work on another module, I just copy and paste and make according changes for that particular module, changing the resources, some objectives, but at least I have a set template. I don't need to retype the common things in every uh, module pages, basically. So that's how it looks like. So in my Word document, first I have the, the objectives, and then I put the, the learning resources. That might be textbook, that might be the notes, and we will talk about in a minute about the My Notes. Some, other, some additional resources as well. Sometimes students would like to see some additional uh, videos or practice problems in math classes. And I provide my uh, screen recorded videos that I provide. So generally try to record short videos and put a meaningful title to the videos when the students working on the, on the assessments, they can come back and check if they would like to. And then the, the assignments. Uh, and I, I also try to put the objective of the assignment as well. So and put some details and the guidance, how they are going to work on that assignment or how they are going to submit that assignment. So that's 
how my Word document looks like for a particular module. And then I just go and copy and paste each of them on, on uh, Canvas on, for each item as a separate pages, creating separate pages. So the, now let me discuss a little bit about the how I prepare the learning resources. And uh, when I'm preparing the notes, I use uh, Microsoft OneNote when I prepare the, the notes and also use the OneNote when I'm screen recording the, the lecture videos as well. And I export that uh, from the OneNote as a PDF and I upload that to the Canvas side as a uh, resource. Uh, and for the screen recording, I there are different options. Some of those are Screencast-O-Matic, uh, Canvas Studio, and with just the Zoom as well, we can also record. And Camtasia is another resources. Those are all available for the UIW faculty, except the Screencast-O-Matic, I think up to 15 minutes, you can also record this the, with this one. Uh, many 15 minutes videos, so it's free basically. And I do very minor editing, so I don't spend too much time about editing. It's not professional videos. And I upload uh, the videos to the Canvas Studio. Uh, and all of those resources are under modules. So they don't student go different places to access those resources. Everything will be available under the, that particular module. And one, one good thing about the Canvas Studio is you can also check which students watch which part of the videos or they didn't watch the, the videos. You can also embed questions within the videos as well. So those are good features of the Canvas uh, Studio. And so it, under my learning resources, I have learning notes that I prepare using the Microsoft OneNote, some learning uh, videos that I recorded, and also I provide some uh, textbook sections or the from the textbook. Uh, and I also provide some additional resources, some additional video examples from the publisher, or I also prepare some additional practice problems where the solutions are available. I want them, I want my students to practice and quiz themselves other than just graded assignments. And also uh, some personal study plan or resources are all available, available to the students. So when I'm preparing uh, the module on Canvas, so first of all, I prepare my uh, all the resources on uh, within the Word document, and then uh, and I, I copy and paste those to the 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 modules as, and when I, cr I create as a pages for each item, objectives, learning resources, and assessments. And when uh, I set up my uh, Canvas homepage as modules, so when students come to the, uh, my course on the Canvas, they see the, the modules. And everything is available within the module, so they don't need to go different places to access the resources and, or to access the, the assignments. So that's how it looks like, uh, my Canvas course, uh, Calculus 1 course site. So when they come to the course, they see the, the modules, the homes, or when they click on the modules, they see the same thing. So the first two, uh, uh, the modules are kind of brief introduction to, to the course and uh, some Canvas orientation. I think I need to clean up some of this. Uh, this Canvas orientation was so detailed, so maybe I need to clean some of those items. And then the particular modules uh, for that for that course. And one quick tip about the Canvas, so as, a, as students, they see their to-do list on the right, so if there are coming up assignments, they see under to-do. They can also see those coming up assignments from the calendar. I really like the calendar feature of the Canvas. So they don't miss their assignments as long as they keep checking their calendar. Uh, that's their nice feature. And the other place they can access their uh, assignments is the syllabus, basically. Now let's uh, look at one particular module and see how it looks like. So let's say module 14. And in that module, so first I provide the objectives. 
So this is a page. So when they click on it, they will see the objectives we will see in a minute. And then the learning resources and then the module assignments or the module assessment tools. So when they start the, the modules, after they click on the first page, they can just use the previous and the next feature of the canvas on any mobile device. So that's very convenient. Uh, using the action words from the Bloom's Taxonomy, I try to use the uh, list the, the objectives for that particular module. And then uh, they have access to the learning resources, reading from the textbook, or some additional notes that I provide and some additional videos and practice problems. And also I embed the videos also under that learning uh, resources site. So maybe I can just go back. I try to divide the videos into smaller chunks uh, where they can just watch some part and then maybe continue for other parts later on. And when you click on the insights, you can see who watched that part of the video or who didn't watch. So they can also write a comment here. They can also write a comment uh, under under the video as well, if there's common thread. But I would rather them to write on the uh, Cardinal uh, Calculus One Cafe rather than writing. Otherwise, I need to check every single uh, videos to to write a comment back. And this is uh, how the the module assessment looks like. So the first one is the section homework from the web assign. But the, when they click on it, they access the, the, that tool so they can start working on it and the exit ticket and the discussion assignment. I will share some quick screenshot of those, but I, I, we don't have time to, de to discuss every details of those assessment tools. Maybe just a, a few of them I can mention. That's how the web assign looks like. They type their answer here. And different questions have different resources. Read it so it takes the textbook for that part, for that section. Or if it has, sometimes it has video so they can watch a video, similar problem with different numbers. And if it has a master it, uh, it breaks down the problem to smaller parts. And the exit tickets are the, the one that I prepare myself. So I uh, give the guideline and the details how they're going to work on that assignment and how they're going to submit it. And maybe just mention a few different type of questions. I want them to explain the concept that, or the concepts that we discuss in that particular module. So I want them to reflect on and express, uh, explain it with their own words. And there are some multiple choice questions. And also there are some questions I want them to work out and then upload their solution. And I provide feedback uh, to their solution as well using the command feature of the canvas. And also, I want to get some feedback about students, how they feel confident with the concepts that they discuss, and also what are the modest points for, or if they have any particular question, and I try to address those as well in the comment section of that assignment. And the, this, the, just one example from the discussion, math and art example. So I want them to draw a house or write their name by using the math equations. So the students really like uh, this assignment. They think that math can be also used for art. So that was, that is a very advanced art. So you can check more from this link when you get, when you have more time to check out. So now, uh, I don't know if, is there any question or? We can move on to the, the these parts. So there are a few questions, Suleiman, and I'll hear I'll kind of have been keeping track on the side. So okay. we'll review these. So one is someone was asking about the Canvas Studio and is it linked in each course? So Kathleen, what did you did you mean that can you have one bank of videos and use it for different courses? Or what are you asking exactly? Yes. So is if you have one thing that I had had trouble with in the past in, in um, Blackboard is making sure that I can pull videos from one to the next and or I had the same trouble with rubrics, but I think I finally figured that out the last semester how to do that, even though I don't need to do that now. But 
sometimes I just want to know if I could, like in Blackboard, we had the one repository of, well, mm -hmm. it, we had Kaltura videos and then we could pull them into other courses. So is it, does it link to each course that you want to use it or is it course specific? All right, that's a really good question. So I'm, I have a little bit of knowledge about that and I know there are a lot of people on here who know a lot more. Um, the little bit I know, because I was just trying it out, is that there's something called My Studio, and you can, that seems to be like your personal library. Um, here we go. Melissa is asking, Melissa, go take it away. Can you guys hear me? I'm, I'm, yep. I'm messing with all of my connections, so I'm afraid that I, I keep going in and out on my connection. So yes, Canvas is absolutely a library um, studio, not course specific. Um, just a big box you can put all your videos in, but you can do individual, I believe they call them collections. It's like a folder. So you can create a folder for a course and you can just you know keep yourself organized but it doesn't mean that you can't be in another course and also grab a video from that collection as well. And then can I just add something too? So you can, um, and Deepti did this with us in, in the course design for Canvas. She shared videos, so she, you can share videos with um, instructors as well. So that's another nice feature. Um, but do you share that from, the creator of the video has to share it with other people then? And Deepti, you can talk about that a little bit. You're the one who. <laughs> <laughs> well, because I figured I'd probably forget to do something. And sure enough, it came in handy. So <laughs> I made a collection. And this is like my first time. Okay, I'm not an expert. So I just tried this and it happened to work. So it's pretty intuitive that way. Um, I went to Canvas Studio. I did my little recording on Canvas Studio and saved it. And then I made a collection because it has a little button called plus collection. And that was like Melissa said, a little folder. And I just put all the related videos on that topic into that collection. And then after that, I was able to, there was like, I think the three dots or something. And it says you can share. And then I was able to share, um, share it with using email I think is how I shared it with Kathy and Melissa or something like that and you can set permissions for that as well uh, how long are the videos that you're looking at uh, putting into uh, into studio uh, how many how many minutes are these like short five minute videos or is it going to be something longer like 20 minutes half an hour yeah, that's a good question, Kathleen. That will help determine where you keep your videos and whether you link them or share the whole video. So, so if you're using Studio, it's a, you know, you want to be five, five to ten minutes or less. Anything longer than that, you'll want to record it in your and then upload it to Stream and then embed or share the video from Stream. So if it's okay, I'm going to pause the video discussion here. We do have some more questions still coming in chat. And by all means, we should carry that on. And Adela, I think your microphone keeps turning back on. I'm not sure, so be careful. Don't want us to hear stuff you don't need us to hear. Um, I'm just going to run through in the last few minutes what I did in my course, um, which was a synchronous course. And it's a little, um, it just looks a little different on Canvas, okay? And uh, so here we have a lower level course for students that had a lot of hands-on learning. And um, go ahead, Suleiman, let's take it to the next uh, slide there. Thank you. So this is, I wanna show you in these slides specifically how the backward design uh, looks when you align it across the syllabus, the course schedule, and into uh, your course assignments and into the Canvas module. So all across all those four things. So this is in the syllabus. Um, here you can see that we've identified really clear goals and standards for the learning. So the numbered list on the left is in terms of general topics. So although we said at the front, at the beginning of this, you know, we don't really want to think about our ideas or our learning objectives in terms of general topics, we want to be specific. So in my mind, these are specific things we're going to be doing. But for the students, it is easy to be thinking about kind of the big ideas of this class, and that's what these are. 
And then on the right where it says PPR 1, 4, 5, those, those are state mandated um, standards because our students in the teacher ed program have to meet certain state um, certification standards and things like that. So we need to make sure that we align and address all of those things. So we want our students to see the alignment. And then finally, the table at the bottom has the course outcomes. So those are specific learning objectives matched with the kinds of assessments that are going to be measuring the learning or assessing the learning in those areas. And even in those little boxes, you'll see it will say PPR competency or an AC standard or things like that. So we want our students to make, we're making it transparent to help them see that all across here, the stuff you're doing lines up with what you're supposed to be trying to learn in this class. And on the next slide, you'll see this is the outline or the course schedule. And here, I reframed those same objectives, but in a more broken down way. So let's look at from, if we look at the top of this, the purple strip uh, specifies what unit it is, right? So we all break up, tend to break up our classes into units. Um, I try to do this to help the students organize the information as well. Um, and then on the left column, it says for February 4th, for instance. So that's week four, February 4th, right? And then the second column has questions. So those are the guiding questions that connect back to the specific course objectives or the learning objectives for that week. And then it says what the reading is in class. And we can see how in week four, we're looking at chapter one of the book, going back to that idea that we don't have to have, the textbook doesn't have to tell us um, what order we present material in. In this case, I found it more useful to present the theory later in the course and do some other things earlier because the theory was a little overwhelming, I felt, without the practical hands-on experiences. And so that's why here we are in week four doing the theory chapters of the book. And then the third column, the red stuff, the red text, is things that are due in Canvas. And then the little bullets tell them, okay, watch this before class, read that thing before class. So it's supplemental readings or things like that. So you can kind of see how the arrows point to the guiding questions and then uh, the in-class assignments, which we'll see next in uh, one of the next slides, okay? So this is that same piece from the course outline or schedule, how it looks in Canvas. So just like um, Suleiman had his modules, so the first module in this case is closed, but the second one is open, and it has the same title as the course schedule. Um, and then it's broken down by week. And so the first arrow points to the name of the unit. The second arrow um, actually points to an in-class assignment, but I should move up before that. So we have week five, and the week five check is a formative assessment, so it's just straight up knowledge and recall, vocabulary from the weeks reading, those sorts of the things that we wish our students already had down a little bit so we could go do application and more in-depth work during class. And so I just kind of get that done. Um, I set it up, I have it set up in Google and they have to earn a, a minimum score of a 90 to get credit for that week, and they're not that hard. They can retake them as many times as they want, but they've got to hit that baseline score. So we all come in knowing some basic vocabulary that we can now deepen our knowledge with. And then the presentation is um, just my slides. And then the in-class part, that's where kind of the magic happens, the gold is. Um, that's the application that the students are doing with the ideas, practicing vocabulary, skills, things like that in class. And you'll get to see that um, in the next slides. So like I said, I use Google Docs. Um, I was already doing that with Blackboard. And this is, this is a Google Slides. I guess literally a blank document. I don't try to even pretty it up. Um, and the first two slides are the instructions of what you're doing. And it, I found that it's helpful to have everything right there. So when students come in and they've forgotten everything we just said two minutes ago, um, it's all right there. So in this case, we were observing different types of play, watching videos. 
uh, that had children playing. And I wanted them to be able to say more about the play than, oh, that's so cute, or they look so, they look like they're having so much fun. Um, so we are, we had a chart of different types of play and how we describe the play and what it tells us about children's development and learning. And uh, so we first did it uh, on the right, you see the links on that little, that area. Thank you, Suleiman. So we practiced with the first video together, all of us, and kind of shared our answers and observations and interpretation. And then they chose one of the second or third videos and got into, they had a blank slide, they just make their own slide and then answer these questions over there, which we'll see in the next slide. And I call that the in-class document. So everybody, by this point in the semester, they know what to do. The first few, we have to kind of practice. So in this slide, you'll see um, these are two students' actual work. And they put the link for the video that they watched. And um, the first one has actually, the one on the left has copied the questions, right? I asked them how many different types of play do you see? And describe one example for each type, um, for as many types as possible. And I asked them to describe what the child is doing um, so that the teacher could see what type of play that was. And so they kind of are connecting between that chart and the vocabulary, the technical terms, and then what they would actually be seeing in real life and bringing it together, right? And I'm getting a glimpse into their thinking process, which is what in the end assessment is hopefully all about, is getting a glimpse into what's going on in their minds. And that first student has also put little photos. That was just something extra they did to show the different types of play as well. So this is where I want to pause. And uh, before we uh, address other questions, I think, Suleiman, you had a couple of questions for us, right, in the polling activity. And we can use the same link. So I'm going to put it back in chat. Okay. You can just click on the link from the chat and participate this post presentation act, uh, poll everywhere activity. Again, that will be just two, three questions. Okay. Uh, write something you find important from this presentation. Okay, start with Zarda, Thumbs, Jamboard. Is that from the previous one, I guess? Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. Great examples from backward design. And that was our intention. Sometimes we want to do something, but we would like to see some examples. So we want to share and we want you to also hear from you all as well. Exit the good yeah. My next goal is uh, pre-class for the face-to-face pre-class reading uh, assignment is another goal I want to implement. <laughs> One little at a time. So yeah. achievable goals, right? <laughs> yeah, I like Suleiman always reminds us that um, we can use this backward design approach in other things in our life, not just in our teaching, but in personal goals and things. And I've been, um, that's been really helpful for me to keep in mind, especially in these last few months. <laughs> <laughs> Organization of materials and examples, yeah. And yeah, Dipte, she did the like week by week uh, structure. I did module by module. But for myself, my case, I also send like weekly emails to the students as an announcement say like these week's modules are module one and two or next week's modules are module 15 and 17. So whichever is convenient for you. Yeah, absolutely. And some of that was because Suleiman's course was asynchronous and mine was not. 
So it you know helps to keep the students on track that way. And one other thing I wanted to mention was that the other benefit, aside from the academics um, of doing this kind of planning from the get-go, is you know Suleiman mentioned how he was trying to incorporate writing or you know discussion and even things like art and art applications of math, things like that into his teaching, right? So a lot of times we do have, from our professional programs, we have dispositional goals and other types of professional goals or just the soft skills types of things that we do want our students to walk away with. And we try, when we don't build it in from the beginning, they become kind of incidental and we forget whether we addressed it or not or that kind of thing. And by planning it in from the beginning, those can become part of our objectives as well. And uh, it makes our course a lot richer and helps us, it sort of uncovers that work that we're doing anyway as, a, as an instructor. Yeah, that, that's a great point, Dipti. So we don't want just to give the academics to the, our students. So this is a higher education, so it should be, they should grow up in all different senses and they should also expose one way or another in different courses. So the next thing is, uh, could you put in order how you would prefer to design your content? So identifying objective, plan assessment and plan instruction. It is identifying the objectives in the first place. And this is the, the, the backward design that we discussed. So that means we achieve actually our uh, presentation goals, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we try when we decided to plan this, we thought we better use backward design to plan our slides as well. <laughs> yeah. and, and the other thing is like, as you see, when we are uh, showing the, the polarity value activity with you, we also discuss on different items that you provide. And I also uh, try to do that when, when I do face-to-face -face class or synchronous class. So use those uh, uh, inputs from the students for classroom discussion as well. So that might be a good idea for poll everywhere activities. Yeah. So are you planning to implement anything from uh, the seminar? Yes. In the first two ones, there were, there were also some questions, I guess they need to think about and how to implement it. Okay, thank you all very much for participating in this. And if there are more questions, I guess, or okay, if anybody would like to share their experience, that would be good to hear as well. Yeah, so there are one or two questions I wrote down here that people had asked. Um, so first, for all the folks interested in looking at how to use video with uh, Canvas, do read the chat because Terry has been posting some other things there as other videos and things that are very helpful. And there are some good questions there. Um, the other questions are for our powers that be in CTL. Um, someone asked, uh, earlier, where can they get to the recorded ver link, the links for the recordings of these sessions? And I know Kathy had recorded some of the previous sessions. How do they do that? Uh, I know one link to them is on the CTL website. I think it's called Teaching and Learning Videos, sort of on the right-hand side of the page. Kathy, is there another location? Um, I'll, I'll put, I'll pop the link in there. Yeah, here. I just put the uh, the CTL's YouTube channel in the chat. Yeah, that's yeah. that's where we put yeah, them. That's where they are, and they're labeled. Great. And then another question, and another point I wanted to bring up to Melissa. Thank you for pointing it out to me. But the link I had to the flipped learning resources through the CTL website doesn't work anymore because that page has changed a bit. So are those still available on the YouTube channel? No, that's. We'll have to work on that. That's a separate, that's just a page. Okay. So we have to find out where that page went. <laughs> okay. So we'll get it back. Me. Bring it back. <laughs> we'll get it back. So go keep looking. Come yeah, on keep, back and keep keep clicking. Yeah, the, the site has been under a little bit of reconstruction and maybe something, you know, got got lost. Okay, great. So I think those were the two questions I caught. Are there anything else or anyone wants to share any other experiences you have? We have about a minute. Uh, the, the only experience I'd like to share is uh, using Blackboard and now setting up my Canvas summer class. I find it's good to have a warm-up for any module. So I have a warm-up as part of every module. 
where not only do I explicitly post the course objectives, but I have a short five minute video of what I expect them to learn. Mm. Then, then we go into the learning lessons and then I'm working on cool down videos. As you saw, this is what you, so a warm up with objectives, videos along the way, a cool down video, and then some small assessment at the end. Great, that's a really interesting idea. I guess Dipte did that in this course design in Canvas. So start with the video. That was very nice. Thank you, Dipte. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that idea. Mm -hmm. we, we all know they read nothing. So videos is key. <laughs> oh, Earl, really? <laughs> Well, I have to, okay, I have to step up for my students here. I have gotten them reading. I, I won't say I take credit for that, but they do. So I just want to put a little shout out to them. Some of them are reading and they do it quite um, earnestly, I will say, too. Maybe I was, was trying to say they prefer video rather than Yes, reading. they do. <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> they've, they've got to read sometimes. <laughs> it's true. Well, thank so you. And in deep, deep, thank you so much. This yes, is your thank you. What an interesting Ooh. session and so informative. Very great. Awesome. Great to see you. Bye. 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 Have a good day, everybody. Mm -hmm.